and the planet. Make this bag number 196 a special bag. Yes, sir. Joe, this crater is a gold mine. And there might be diamonds in the next one. Yeah, babe. Then we saw another practical use of television in lunar exploration. And Dave, uh, you're going to want to cinch up Jim's collection bag probably before you go much longer. It's coming uh, very loose there. Okay. It's coming, uh, very loose. Let me do it right now, Joe, Just don't, so we don't forget it. Roger, we sure don't want to lose that one. Up. I don't know what we'll do without you, Joe. Okay, Jim, let's get on a rover and head back. Okay. Yeah. They returned to the science station where Scott once more manned the drill to place the second heat flow probe and later to get a deep core sample. The difficulty in drilling was shown by Scott's hand, which would carry bruised fingernails from his efforts for several weeks after the mission. Okay, Dave, take heart. You've got just one minute of drilling left. Okay, we made a little money, didn't we? And over fifth. It was time to get back into the LEM and end EVA-2. The drill and attached sections were left in the ground for removal during the next day's traverse. On Earth, scientists poured over data from the television, from the astronauts' descriptions, and from the orbiting experiments. The 1,400 photographs the crew would return would themselves constitute a major scientific legacy. Lunar exploration was achieving a new maturity. We are now exploring to test new hypotheses, and the pieces were fitting together. One scientist, when asked why he didn't sit down and rest after an around-the-clock session, replied, I can't. I'm too excited. Well, it's nice to be outside where you can stretch a little bit. OK. Into the site. Yeah, I'll meet you up there. Out to the drill. We last left our friend. Oh, it's our friend, huh? Yes, it is. Uh, if we could just get our shoulder under that. <laughs> Their first stop was at the drill they had left during the second EVA. This core tube was the deepest sample ever collected from the moon. Perhaps the deepest we would ever get. Eight and a half feet beneath the surface, cutting through 58 distinct layers. This would not only tell us more about the lunar structure, but contained in this soil were traces of particles emitted by the sun billions of years ago, which would give us a clue to the early years of the solar system. But now it was time to leave the core tube, to be picked up later, and head west-northwest to the rim of Hadley Rill. Then Scott and Irwin descended a short distance over the rim of Hadley Rill to get a piece of one of the large blocks thought to be lunar bedrock. It's a big rock there. Sure is. Let's go down and get the chunk of the bedrock here. Get a little closer so you get that big chip out of there. Boy, what a rock. Get ready to move out, Dave. Okay, how 
They buckled their seat belts for the ride back to the lunar module. Oh, what a big mountain that Hadley is. Yeah, it's beautiful. The sun is really fierce. Oh, look at the mountains today, Jim, when they're all sunlit. Isn't that beautiful? It really is. Oh, golly, that's just super. You know, unreal. Dave, I'm reminded of a favorite biblical passage from Psalms. I look unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. Of course, we get quite a bit from Houston, too. After a stop to pick up the core samples, they returned to the LEM to close out their final traverse. But first, Scott would make history, canceling a stamp on an interplanetary envelope. I'm very proud to have the opportunity here to play postman. What could be a better place to cancel the stamp than right here at Hadley Rill? Then a demonstration of a classic experiment. got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, that proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Finally, Scott drove the rover away from the LEM so that its TV camera could pick up a picture of the coming liftoff. As the spaceport Reisling would say, we're ready for you to come back again to the homes of men on the cool green hills of Earth. Thank you, Joe. We're ready to. But it's been great. 171 hours and 37 minutes after they had lifted off the planet Earth, Scott and Irwin would lift off its sister planet, accompanied by a musical salute they themselves would provide from a small tape recorder on board. This lift off, automatic. Hey, good smooth ride, Ed. Almost sounds like the wind whistling, doesn't it? Oh, what a view of the rail, huh? Older tracks coming down into it. Rendezvous and docking procedures were flawless, right on the money. But their jobs were not over yet. They would spend two more days in lunar orbit gathering data from the experiments and photography. One more day around the moon than any preceding mission. On August 4th, they prepared to come home. But even on their last orbit of the moon, they had another experiment. They placed in orbit a sub-satellite, the first ever launched by a manned spacecraft. It was designed to circle the moon for a year, measuring variations in lunar gravity, the strength and direction of interplanetary and Earth magnetic fields, and the flow of charged particles in space. Packing stations have acquired the satellite. Oh, very good. Then the burn to bring them back to Earth. But their jobs were far from over. 172,000 miles from Earth, Al Warden left the spacecraft to retrieve the 8,000 feet of film contained in the cassettes of the Experiment Bay cameras. Later, they would turn their X-ray spectrometer toward the newly discovered X-ray pulsars, those mysterious black holes in space. At the same time, in accord with the previous plan, an Earth-based Soviet observatory scanned the same areas visually to help derive a model consistent with both sets of observations. During the trip home, 
The X-ray spectrometer would observe seven X-ray sources and gather 50 hours of galactic data. Then, on August 7th, they looked into the fireball created by the heat of their re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour. And there would be a heart-stopping moment as one of the three parachutes collapsed. However, the landing system was designed to use two parachutes. The third parachute was an added safety factor. Today, that margin paid off. The success of Apollo 15 had been spectacular. The scientific results had been almost unbelievable. In the words of one scientist, a five-for-one mission. Yet while we rejoice in our success, we cannot afford to forget the sometimes painful efforts that gave us these achievements. Spacecraft Commander Dave Scott. I think many people have contributed to this pinnacle we've reached. Some have contributed more than others. And we know of 14 individuals who contributed all they had. And because of that, well, we left a, a small memorial on the moon about 20 feet north of Rover 1 in a small, subtle crater. There's a simple plaque with 14 names. And those are the names in alphabetical order of all the astronauts and cosmonauts who have died in the pursuit of exploration of space. Near it is a small figure representing the fallen astronaut. We went to the moon as trained observers in order to gather data, uh, not only with our instruments on board, but with our minds. And I'd like to quote a statement from Plutarch, which I think expresses our feelings uh, since we've come back. The mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire to be lighted. Thank you. April 16, 1972. Apollo 16, man's fifth lunar landing, sat silently on the pad awaiting its mission. Inside the astronaut quarters, its relaxed crew ate Sunday breakfast. John Young, a veteran of three previous space flights, was commander. Ken Mattingly, Command module pilot would conduct orbital experiments around the moon, while Charles Duke explored the lunar surface with Young. April 22nd, Young and Duke would find themselves strapped into a small electric car called the Rover, bouncing across the lunar plateau known as Descartes. Ah, uh, the old water bag is working super. This is going to be a good day, Charlie. As Young and Duke rode the bucking rover to the lunar formation called Stone Mountain, NASA geologist Farouk El Baz wrote on a blackboard on Earth, there is nothing so far removed from us to be beyond our reach or so hidden that we cannot discover it. Rene Descartes. As John Young would later remark, Apollo 16 would certainly help prove that Rene Descartes was right. Almost like a uh, freshly plowed field that's been rained on. Yet less than two days before, it looked as though this would never happen. It was, in Young's words, a real cliffhanger. 
The Marshall Space Flight Center team was working on a launch vehicle gyroscope problem that threatened to scrub the mission. Less than an hour before liftoff, their advisory to the Kennedy Space Center launch team was go. had been perfect. During the three-day flight to lunar orbit, the problems encountered had been more annoyances than critical, such as paint flaking off the lunar module, later a jammed antenna in one of the lunar module's several communication systems. All in all, it had been a quiet flight. April 19th. The burn into lunar orbit was right on. Well, Houston, uh, Sweet 16 has arrived. The subsequent maneuvers all went without a hitch. Then the next day, April 20th, Young and Duke undocked the lunar module preparatory to landing, leaving Mattingly in the command module. The next maneuver was for Mattingly to burn the main engine of his spacecraft to put it into a circular orbit. But as the lunar module emerged from behind the moon... No start. We copy, no start. No start. No start. No cert. In preparing for the circularization burn, Mattingly had found apparent uncontrolled oscillations in the main engine's backup control system. Following mission rules, he did not make the burn. How long do you think it's going to take him to get around to this, Jerry? I, I think your estimate is a couple of uh, three minutes. With the backup system having trouble, only the primary system was known to be usable on the engine needed to get the astronauts out of lunar orbit and back to Earth. However, the lunar module engines could be used if the two spacecraft were docked. The first step in the problem-solving technique, stabilize the situation in the safest manner. Get the two spacecraft, which had separated, close enough together to dock if necessary. You have to get them back together, get the things back as they want them, get them mentally prepared to do what you're going to do. Yeah. But now don't take that as input. I, I'm, I'm asking you to pitch yeah. down out loud. I don't want to make it up unless I'm sure. I don't see any way we can continue on. At that moment, the chances for a landing looked pretty slim. But you look at a problem step by step. Step one underway, you look at step two. Analyze the problem as completely as possible within the time frame. We should make sure that that's gone, but there's no way that no one no, 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 have any uh, other redundancy or, uh, or other routes. And in lunar orbit, Mattingly flew the command module to a rendezvous as Young talked him in. Okay, Brian, why don't you tell me uh, what to do there, John? Okay. Got Word's it. coming back kind of initially from North American that they're suspecting a, a rate feedback. Feeling 45 is coming to it. The team was coming up to speed, not only at the manned spacecraft center, but from MIT in Massachusetts to North American in Southern California. Isolate the trouble. Simulate it. Evaluate it. You can't use it if you get a broken wire. You don't know it's going to come back again. You know, like a person the other way. Not according to my needles. Okay, I'll believe your needles. Then you would have had no option. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, then it's full speed ahead. I just don't much see how we can make it on the next move. I think you guys ought to continue to work. You'd, so you'd only do it if you had a failure on the primary. Well, how would you ever get the damn thing trimmed then? Well, I would. I would. If I had a failure on primary, I'd shut it down. Yeah, we must be going in the right direction then. 
Isolate, simulate, evaluate. The results were coming in. It was beginning to pay off. The simulator tests and other data were showing that with the engine on, the oscillations would do no harm. Despite the earlier pessimism, it was beginning to look pretty good. Okay, when you come up on uh, AOS, on the next rev, rev 15, we'll give you a go or no go for another try. Man Spacecraft Center Director, Dr. Christopher C. Kraft, Jr. Just came back into the control center after having attended a meeting by management people in one of the back rooms, and the situation is go for landing. Well, have at it, Dave. So we're going to try. You do have a go for another try here at the PDI on Rev 16. Once more, they would pass behind the moon. And on the next revolution, John Young and Charlie Duke would start their swift descent to the Descartes Plateau. Okay, go to our initialization, looks good. Right on, lock, lock. feel that duty, come on. 200, pro. It's over. It's over. Huh? And there it is, Gator, Lone Star. Right oh, on. Oh, probably the same, Charlie. Okay, 40 degrees, 38 degrees. Right on. Right on dot, north ray. Looks like we're going to be able to make it, John. There's not too many blocks up there. Ryan, you go for landing. Uh, well, that's, right now, looks pretty good. Looking good. Looking good. Yeah. 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 That comes the shadow. Okay. The original plan had called for Young and Duke to get out and explore shortly after landing. However, the near abort had lasted six hours. The tired astronauts would sleep. April 21. Mission Commander John Young stepped onto the Descartes Formation, 11.58 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. They are mysterious and unknown Descartes. Island planes, Apollo 16 is going to change your image. While their activities were monitored by mission control, Young and Duke were also observed by scientists located across the hall in the science support room. After unloading the rover from its storage bay in the lunar module, they planted the flag. Hey, John, this is perfect with the limb and the rover and you and, and the stone mountain and the old flag. Come on out here and give me a salute. Big Navy salute. Off the ground, one more. There we go. Best. Young set up an ultraviolet camera to provide the first astronomical observations from the moon. He took pictures of the Earth's upper atmosphere and magnetosphere and their interaction with the solar wind. He also photographed the interstellar gas present throughout space and the ultraviolet halos that appear around galaxies. Astronomers have long wanted a telescope on the moon. Perhaps this experiment would show the moon an ideal base for future astronomical observations. You, you want two pins? Yeah, we would like two pins. John, sir. I'm not leaning on it. Duke drilled a hole into which a heat flow probe was to be placed, part of one of the experiments attached to the station. As Duke drilled, Young set up the central station and the remainder of the experiments. Then what many considered the biggest disappointment of the mission.
wire, so that means you've got to uh, you've got to mate all those wires, separate wires in there, and have them insulated from one another. That's right. And uh, if that doesn't occur, what are the chances of shorting out the central station? Well, that's another one that they're working. Uh, On Earth, they tried to figure a way to fix the heat flow. On the moon, the astronauts continued with the other experiment. Young placed a series of sensors in the soil, then fired explosive charges, mapping the lunar subsurface much as geologists on Earth use explosives to search for oil. They continue to sample the area and activate the experiment. Then they returned to the rover and prepared for their first trip away from the landing site in search for geological samples. And here we go. Their first traverse would take them about one kilometer west of the landing site. They would make two stops to collect samples and conduct experiments. Well, that's, that's 105 through 9 in the flight plan. Well, it couldn't pick a better spot. John, you're just beautiful. That is the most beautiful sight. What's that? You're standing there on the rim of that crater. This guy don't really know. Young used a portable instrument to measure the local magnetic field. He would later record the most intense magnetic field ever found on the moon far higher than scientists ever suspected. It's really some crater. As you come around there, there's a rock in the near field on this rim that has some white on the top of it. We'd like you to pick it up with a grab sample. This one right here? That's it. This, this one right here? That's it. You got it right there. OK, we got that. There would be one more stop before they got back to the lunar module to close out this EBA. With Duke acting as photographer, and Young as driver, they put the rover through a full test. Man, you are really bouncing. Is he on the ground at all? Yeah, that's 10 kilometers. Huh? He's got about two wheels on the ground. OK, turn sharp. I have no desire to turn sharp. <laughs> okay, here's a sharpie. Hey, that's great. He's a big rooster tail out of all four wheels. And as he turns, he skids. The back end breaks loose just like on snow. Come on back, John. Hey, the deck is running. And I'll tell you, Andy's never seen a driver like this. Okay, when he hits the craters and starts bouncing is when he gets his rooster tail. He makes sharp turns. <laughs> then it was back to their lunar base. Activate experiment and close out EVA-1. Hey, that's right. Please don't take pictures of the uh, hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> he had a hot dog there. Showing the low residue, high protein diet. Hey, that's right. Please don't take pictures of the hot dogs. He had a hot dog there. On Earth, the scientists took a break. Tomorrow would be another busy day. <laughs> April 22nd. The lunar surface temperature in the sun should be around 135 degrees today. Today they were headed a little over four kilometers south to climb their rover up the side of Stone Mountain. Man, we are really going up a hill, I'll tell you. Their first station, a crater 700 feet above their lunar module.
you what we could do. If we got the no, great soil, if we got a certain something, yeah. we could go to one man sampling oh, and maybe do it. They would make a total of six stops on this traverse, collecting samples from large rocks down to the intermediate to the smallest soil particles. They would operate experiments measuring the strength of local magnetic fields, measuring the resistance of the soil to compaction. The sampling time used up. It was time to return to the rover and head back to the lunar module. And they did it in two minutes less travel time right than they were pre planned. Fantastic. Tony, how about an extension, you guys? We feeling good. Is that all we're going to do tonight? We'll sit around and talk. But with the limited oxygen and water in the backpack, it was finally time to close out EVA 2. Okay. Now I think they realize that it's not more, uh, well, a gee whiz, like my friend said, uh, thrill, but it's real exploration, and it is much more serious and uh, much more uh, important for the future of mankind than uh, just a plain exploit, a technical or technological exploit. This is exploration. Ray Bradbury claims that what mankind sees in the exploration of space is his first chance at immortality since, he's, since he invented religion. April 23rd. The decision had been made not to try and fix the broken heat flow experiment because of the time and complexities involved. Traverse number three. Today, Young and Duke would head north about five kilometers to North Ray Crater, the largest lunar crater to be sampled by men. Outstanding. Hey, Tony, it seems to me this is a, uh, a more subdued surface over here than going towards South Ray. Oh, spectacular. Just spectacular. Wow. Sorry, Charlie. Beautiful. I gotta keep my eye on the drive. That's great. Yeah. Jack, that's a good point to remember. All three crews now tend to think they're there before they get there. I remember. Man, does this thing have steep walls. They said 60 degrees. Now, I tell you, I can't see to the bottom of it, and I'm as close to the edge as I'm going to get. <laughs> that's the truth. Now, the routine, if anything on the moon can be called that. Test, collect, photograph. Keep moving. Time is precious on the moon. They look like drill holes is what they look like. Do that in West Texas and you get a rattlesnake. Here you get permanently shattered soil. How about rolling that one over? No way. Then, one of the most spectacular discoveries of the mission. Look at the size of that biggie. <laughs> it is a biggie, isn't it? It may be further away than we think. No, it's not very far. It was just right beyond you. And we better press on to the big boulder. <laughs> okay, we're headed that way. You get the tongs, son, John? Yep. I'll carry the rake. That big black dot. Can't see it. If, if we could see to the bottom, we could say for sure if this big black rock is right out of the bottom. But uh, my guess from the old photographs is it probably is. Okay, that sounds like a good guess. Yeah. Uh, you don't need more than that, though. It looks like they were standing right there. Look at the size of that rock. I'm curious what they're going to look like when they stand next to it. <laughs> we can see. The closer I get to it, the bigger it is. Yeah, but look at the permanent shadow part, Charlie. On this side over here? Yeah. And as our crew fully. <laughs> 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 
We bet a pond that disappeared into the sunset. Well, Tony, that's your half rock right there. Very good. Don't get too near the edge of that thing. It falls off. Look, look over Look over at your right. It falls off pretty good. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we Keep going. Can't believe it. Got it. I can't even. And we encourage you just to look for some variety. But now it was time to head back to their base and close out the EBA. All right, we think you could just about to head south now. Yeah, the only reason. That's it. Oh, we're, we're going uh, south. Home again, home again. Diggity dig. During the previous EBA, a section of a rear fender had come off the rover. 